Grace and mercy and peace be yours from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We turn to our epistle lesson, which we have already heard, where we hear all sorts of advice in that final chapter of Hebrews on how to live humbly as faithful Christians. In fact, our readings for these past weeks have been focusing our attention, haven't they, on the great responsibility that Christians have to keep their faith and to keep it living and active and productive. Last week, Jesus reminded us that there's only one way into heaven, the narrow door. And a couple of weeks ago, Jesus told us that that as Christians, we may even have family troubles where we, because of the gospel, have to choose between relatives and Jesus himself. And our epistle lessons from Hebrews have also focused on striving to imitate the great examples of faith, such as Abraham and the prophets. Today, as that book of Hebrews draws to a close, the author draws it all together, we might say, under the theme, continue in Christ's humble service. We have a list of commands given to us in our text. Well, none of us likes to be commanded to do things. Why should we listen to these commands? Why would we want to be servants, we free people? Why would we want to be servants of anyone, even if it's Christ? And of course, first and foremost, we do want to be servants of Christ because of what Jesus humbly and willingly did for us to bring us to the Father. After all, as scripture says, we love because he first loved us. The author of this epistle has described Jesus' willing service for us and his suffering for us using a number of striking Old Testament pictures. And today, as he brings the epistle to conclusion, he chooses one more somewhat unusual picture when he says Jesus suffered outside the gate for this reason, to sanctify people by his own blood. Jesus was the ultimate outsider, and by following him, that makes us outsiders also, at least as far as this world goes. But then Jesus' whole life was focused outside of this world, and instead on the life of the world to come. But he didn't do that for himself. If Jesus simply wanted to focus for his own sake on the other world, the world we are looking forward to, he could have just stayed there because Jesus was eternally begotten of the Father and lived permanently in heaven before he came down to earth. But Jesus came down to this earth specifically for the purpose of being a servant, of following commands, of doing everything it took to rescue us out of this world so that we could spend eternity with him in heaven. When Jesus was in Jerusalem during Holy Week, before he was taken outside of the city, Jesus most certainly as he said in the Garden of Gethsemane, could have summoned more than 12 legions of angels and kicked everybody else out of the city. Instead, Jesus suffered outside the gate for this reason, to sanctify people by his own blood. And Jesus is just as incredibly self-sacrificing for you today as he was then. As our text reminds us, Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. He who humbled himself to the point of obeying even the littlest and seemingly most insignificant of the laws God had set up 
is certainly concerned about the littlest and the smallest details of your life. Jesus was willing to allow himself, Son of God, to be circumcised by some rabbi on the eighth day. If he is that concerned about details, then he is that concerned about your daily needs. He who let himself be thrown out of Jerusalem will move heaven and earth to keep his elect from being snatched out of his hand and kept from heaven. Jesus knew it was all about eternity above. And so do we believers, as our text says, for we do not have a permanent city here, but we are looking for the city that is coming. Because of Jesus' love and sacrifice for us, and because we want to follow him all the way to heaven, the author urges us to adopt the same attitude as he did. Jesus suffered outside the gate for this reason, to sanctify people by his own blood. So then let us go to him outside of the camp, bearing his disgrace. For we do not have a permanent city here, but we are looking for the city that is coming. In our readings from Hebrews these past few weeks, we've been reminded of a whole bunch of Old Testament history as the apostle pleaded with Jewish Christians to remember the lessons of the faith and not abandon the faith and go back to Judaism. Recall especially that, that wonderful Heroes of Faith chapter, chapter 11, that we heard three weeks ago. All of those heroes of faith, every single one of them, including Abraham, was saved by faith despite being a sinner. And by the power of faith, all of them then willingly endured hardships as they struggled to live, quoting chapter 11, as strangers and foreigners on this world. Often they fell, and God lifted them up. They sinned, and God cleansed them. And the more they realized how gracious and merciful and long-suffering the Lord was who kept picking them up after they fell, the more they wanted to show their gratefulness to God and serve him who loved them unconditionally. What about us? Do we appreciate how much the Savior suffered for us so that we are willing to suffer for him? Do we love him enough that we also tremble at his word and strive to obey all his commands? Are we ready to eagerly say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening? Are his commands burdensome to us? Or is his yoke easy? Well, your flesh gives the one answer, but your spirit gives the other. Which is why we need reminders like this text to continue in Christ's humble service. On the last day, Jesus tells us, after he had separated the sheep and the goats, and he has gathered us at his right hand, he will list some of the things that we have done for him in humble service. And each time, as Jesus describes it, he will list how we served him by serving people. I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. I was naked. You clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. When did we do that, Lord? Whatever you have done for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you have done for me. Those are the things that our text is reminding us to do now. Confident of the Lord's unconditional love and forgiveness through Christ, we want our attitude to be 
Thank you, Lord. What can I possibly do to show you my gratefulness? And here is his answer. Continue to show brotherly love. Do not fail to show love to strangers. For by doing this, some have welcomed angels without realizing it. Remember those in prison as if you were fellow prisoners. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were also suffering bodily. Marriage is to be held in honor by all, and the marriage bed is to be kept undefiled, for God will judge sexually immoral people and adulterers. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, for God has said, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Let's take these one by one. Brotherly love. That term brother means especially our fellow believers. We have a very rare thing in common. We share minority status. We are all together outsiders. Together we confess to the world the one true faith, and together we are on a narrow and lonely path. Together we face common enemies the devil, the world, and even our own sinful flesh. We need to treasure the very, very special relationships we share in Christ with our fellow members and our fellow Christians. Secondly, show hospitality and do not forget to do good and share with others for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Some have welcomed angels, as did Abraham the day the three visitors came to him to tell him about the impending doom of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham fed them all a marvelous meal before he ever found out that two of them were angels, and one of them was the angel of the Lord, that is, the pre-incarnate Christ himself to whom he served dinner. Who knows how many examples have not ever been written of where people have indeed housed and fed angels sent on a mission. Remember those in prison. When this epistle was written, Christians were under persecution for their faith, and many of them were being locked up for being believers, some even killed. Well, guess what? Nothing has changed. Millions of Christians are under violent persecution also today in places like the Middle East, in North Korea, in Somalia, in Nigeria, and more and more now in China. Marriage should be honored by all. For years, pastors used to have to explain to their flocks about places like Rome and Corinth and how immoral they were. We no longer have to make those explanations because America now matches those places. We've changed the definition of marriage and even in the church people divorce willy-nilly not honoring marriage as God said. Meanwhile pastors have to tell young couples Um, you're going to need to move out before we can consider having a Christian wedding. We need scripture like this to remind us to be outsiders and to be different. Keep your lives free from the love of money because that is idolatry, trusting something other than God who meant it when he promised, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Sixth, avoid false teachers and confess the true faith. Do not be carried away, he writes, by all kinds of strange teachings. Through Jesus, let us constantly offer to God a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips that confess his name. False teaching is so prevalent today. And even we are exposed to it by friends who 
read weird so-called Christian books, by television preachers, by so many of our neighbors even who say they're Christians but hear strange stuff on Sunday morning. And we know that that false teaching seeps into our own thinking when we hear people say, Pastor, stop talking about that. Just focus on the positive. We don't want you to fulfill your role of guarding and warning the flock. And finally, number seven, honor, imitate, and obey your spiritual leaders, past and present. He writes, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Carefully consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as men who will give an account. Obey them so that they may do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no benefit to you. As we look at these and any and all of the commands of God, we can't help but be reminded of our many shortcomings, our many sins. And that is God's will, that we are reminded of these so that we repent each day. But then let us also remember that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's the same yesterday who willingly shed his blood and gave his life to purify us from all unrighteousness. He's the same today when he comes to us through his word and sacraments and he will be the same tomorrow when he comes to bring us to the city that is coming. And that is our reason to continue in Christ's humble service. Amen.